<laughs> Try again. <laughs> Welcome to Cody, Wyoming and Voices of Faith and Leadership. And today we have a healthcare panel. And I'm hoping with all three of your experience and knowledge, we can tackle and fix this problem. Well, <laughs> <Why not? laughs> um, healthcare from the physical aspect of things, the community aspect of things, insurance, a legal system, uh, mental health. Uh, incorporates a lot, doesn't it? Yes. We have Greg McHugh, Dr. Greg McHugh, from here in Cody. We have, checking my notes, Roy Eckert. Correct, from Powell. From Powell. And Wendy Morris. From here in Cody. Here in Cody. And I'm going to let you introduce yourselves more as you bring your expertise uh, to, to the group. This is our 2024 cohort of the Voices of Faith and Leadership, as well as a few people online. And we are recording, or at least trying right. to record. <laughs> <laughs> Warren Murphy, our local connection here in Cody, arranged for you all to be here to help us out, help us understand some of the difficulties, some of the things that contribute to the con confusion and the complications of getting good health care, mental and physical, to the people of Wyoming. And maybe how we can help and, uh, communities. And you got all you got two hours to do that. <laughs> Great. So, yeah. We'll try to fit it in. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and do yeah, leave us with at least one or two things we can do in our local communities to help the situation. Great. Why don't we introduce ourselves just you know you're talking to me? Perfect. Love that. And and I'm not going to turn the camera, but I'm Anne Marie Delgado, the executive director for Wyoming Interfaith Network. And I live in the north east corner of the state in Beulah. I'm Elizabeth Mount. I'm the pastor at the Unitarian Universalist Church of Cheyenne, Wyoming. Angie Floyd from Saratoga, Wyoming. Warren Murphy, we know. <laughs> Diane Martin, Powell, Wyoming. And Patricia Bell, pastor at Frontier United Methodist Church in Cheyenne. And I'm Mary Fabin, out of Saratoga. Uh, if you can't tell, we're sisters, <laughs> uh, not twins. <laughs> and I'm the program manager for the Voices of Faith and Leadership. Thanks. Thank you for having us. Um, I think I will go first for my introduction. I'm Wendy Morris, like you mentioned. Um, I am the coalition, I guess, director, coordinator, um, chaos manager for um, Healthy Park County, which is our local um, health and wellness um, prevention coalition. So we are very fortunate here in the state of Wyoming to have prevention funding um, throughout um, our counties. The prevention funding does come through the Department of Health and is um, funded to the, the counties directly through the commissioners. And then the commissioners get to decide how they want to um, use those funds locally. Here in Park County, um, we have a memorandum of understanding with um, One Health, which is a federally qualified free clinic here, excuse me, a federally qualified health center here in um, Park County. So I'm an employee actually of One Health, but I manage these um, prevention dollars on behalf of Park County. But it's, um, I think, important to note, and I'm going to go ahead and give you your call to action on the front end. Um, every county in Wyoming has prevention dollars. And as part of that, um, most of them, I would say a majority of them also have a prevention coalition. So for example, here we have Healthy Park County. In your county, um, you would might have another um, a gathering, uh, but a coalition that would come together and work on um, prevention, but also um, and other health and wellness issues in your community. Ours, we gather together um, once a month and we alternate between Powell and Cody. And we um, have oftentimes guest speakers. We talk about um, emerging trends and ways that we can support evidence-based uh, prevention strategies and initiatives um, in our community. I would say the funding that I work with specifically right now is um, very specific to mental health promotion and suicide prevention. And so we can talk more about that um, during our time together. But we also have money that we use to um, support underage um, um, 
not underage drinking, but <laughs> um, support, yes. yes, we're not supporting that. But um, how can we uh, support conversations around underage drinking? And right now, a really important topic in our state and in our communities is vaping. Mm -hmm. So if you don't know um, about vaping, I'm, I'll definitely be um, able to have that conversation at some point as well. But that is something that we are seeing a huge rise in our young people um, using um, nicotine um, and vaping devices. We also um, work with our bars and um, restaurants and um, <laughs> bars and restaurants around um, um, responsible beverage service, so overconsumption, as well as our counties and healthcare partners with opioids. And so just um, lots of um, upstream conversations for families and um, communities around around prevention work, but primarily around substance use prevention and mental health and suicide prevention. I think that that's enough for me for now, but I'm open to any questions and conversation. Well, what? <laughs> I'm still learning how to introduce myself. So <laughs> I retired in December after 36 years of law enforcement. I retired as a uh, chief of police in Val. I can't introduce myself that way anymore. So I'm now an executive officer with the Lab Association of Sheriffs and Chiefs of Police. Spent the last decade spending a lot of time with our prevention folks and learning the prevention side of the house and how we as law enforcement come to the table to assist with some of these efforts as the laundry list that we just put out there. I will piggyback on the call to action. And you know, I, I hear a lot from law enforcement when it comes to prevention. How is this a law enforcement problem? Why is this a police problem? And I've challenged peers both across the state and the nation. If you haven't looked up police in the dictionary lately, you really need to. It doesn't matter if it's Wikipedia or Webster's Dictionary, you'll find a five-fold mandate to police. And only two of them have anything to do with law enforcement. That's the public peace and order. The other three are the health, morals, and safety of the community. We see a lot of the struggles that we see around the country because we're only addressing the two. We've got to go for a full circle and address the other three to truly uh, make change in our communities. And that's where our role falls in this prevention work. And I would say the same thing about our faith based community. Ooh. It is always a challenge. And, and, and the interfaith network is profound because it's different faith bases working together. And there needs to be more of that. And we need our faith based community at the table with our prevention coalitions having these conversations. Uh, the more we can we can overlap these circles, the more effective we can be within our communities. So a big part of my focus over the last decade has been mental health, uh, both first responder mental health and that in our communities with programs like crisis intervention teams. And I can talk more about those later. And it's just introduction. I'll leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, my name is Gregory Q. Uh, I'm a retired family physician. From, I practiced uh, essentially my whole career here in Cody Wyoming, about 40 years. And uh, in that, I have, uh, you know, during the time, been able to kind of see uh, the evolution of uh, the provision of medical care in a, in a small town. When we started out, uh, we had uh, no in-house in emergency room physicians. Uh, my wife was, a, was an emergency room nurse that uh, would manage trauma until the emergency room physician could shave and shower and drive 20 miles into the emergency room. Uh, and uh, that has evolved into uh, a, a really high-quality team effort involving in-house emergency room physicians, mm -hmm. physical therapists, respiratory therapists, dietitians, yeah. and uh, enormous well-trained support staff, and a uh, expansion of our medical staff from uh, a few of us to now well over, it was like, 40 or 45 or something like that, including visiting doctors when I retired. So I have no idea what they've got on staff now. Um, and I guess where 
a big part of what I have tried to do over the years has been trying to, to do preventative care. That's sort of the family physician's own uh, preventative care as far as uh, lifestyle as, and as well as medical treatment early on in the case of diseases and uh, the early diagnosis of serious illness, even the diseases that are currently treatable. And so this kind of uh, fits in well with the, the current issues that the that this point kind of wanted me to address is Medicaid expansion in this state. The, uh, and that is, is complicated. It, uh, and, and maybe I can just kind of start out with basically a, a history and an understanding. I don't know where your level of understanding is of where Medicaid is and what Medicaid is and the problems that are associated with its, with its administration. But uh, Medicaid is, is a state program and, and it's, a, it's a state and federal program that uh, the feds pay uh, anywhere between uh, 50 and 90 percent of the cost of providing medical care to people that are not uh, financially able to provide for themselves. The um, about 2010, uh, the Affordable Care Act was signed into law, and it supplemented the Medicaid and private insurance with the subsidized private, private insurance. It was originally designed to have subsidized private insurance, Medicaid, and then uh, an expansion of Medicaid to cover the people that didn't qualify for subsidies for private insurance and made too much money to uh, receive Medicare, Medicaid benefits. And here lies the problem currently. Later, after that was signed, they, uh, several states took the federal government to court and reversed the decision that all states must expand Medicaid to cover that gap. And they said that is up to the state to decide whether to finance their portion, because the federal government will, form, will finance 90% of that. But it's up to the state to provide that 10% that Phil that pays for these, uh, for people that make too much money for Medicaid, which is, these are a, a year old or so, something like $900, $1,000 a month for a family of four. Uh, if you're under that, you can- For insurance? Or total income. Okay. Oh, 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 oh that, that was my question. That's yeah. right. It's, okay. it's the uh, maximum. Federal poverty, right? Right. It's a, it's a percentage of the federal poverty level, and it's but that's the maximum you can make and, and be qualified for Medicaid. Um, the Affordable Care Act put a floor in that said you must make more money. And it's about, I think, mean, quantity for a family of four um, is somewhere around 2,500. It's, uh, and again, it's a percentage of the federal poverty level. So you've got somebody that makes more than $1,000 a month and less than $2,500 a month. There really is no, the situation other than paying full price private insurance and uh, or going without or going without and honestly that is the really only option uh, private insurance for a uh, family for is uh, I don't even know what it's going to be but it would be easily within in excess of a thousand dollars would be basically in excess of your total. This happened to me before seminary when I was working like three or four part-time jobs and I was making just enough that I 
was under the subsidy level and over the Medicaid level. And it went from, it would have been $0 a month fully subsidized. And because I was like $300 under, uh, it was gonna be $468 a month out of, like, I can't live on that. That was more than my rent at the time. <laughs> It would have been the rest of my paycheck. I wouldn't have been able to afford food. Exactly. Like, and there's no remedy for that. Yeah. In the state of Wyoming. It's just not. Uh, they're, they're really, and I'll, I'll get into what other people might say about that. But, uh, but <laughs> well, it, it, I'm just like, would it cost people a lot more if I broke a leg or something getting to work <laughs> and had to use exactly. emergency care because they couldn't have paid for it? And you're why or that's why I'm sitting here <laughs> yeah. talking about expanding Medicaid because uh, there are some uh, there are some mis uh, not misinformation but not misinformation but maybe a, a lack of understanding and you address uh, a couple of them right there okay uh, you'll hear. Uh, people say, well, why why are we paying good money for well, or, or what's the term there, uh, healthy people that don't want to pay their insurance, that don't want to, that don't want to buy insurance, or, uh, uh, or don't want to work, and therefore they don't have insurance. Well, this you're a perfect example. You work four jobs, none of them offer insurance. None of them pay enough to pay for private insurance, and uh, you you're just you're, you're stuck, and you are actually in a better position if you don't work, mm -hmm. because then you've got a shot at Medicaid or, or welfare or, or whatever. So it actually pushes people where they don't want to be, and the people that uh, that uh, we're trying to expand Medicaid for are working towards their jobs. They've got a small business. They've got a small ranch and farm. And if you are in a car accident, or if you are decided diagnosed with a major illness, it's the luck of the draw because they will take your business or your ranch. Uh, the number one cause of uh, blanking, foreclosure, uh, foreclosure for and bankruptcy. bankruptcy. Number one cause of bankruptcy in the country is and medical debt. Right. So we're just taking these people out of out of circulation. That that you know you don't know what that business that little business that just got wiped out uh, is could have done in twenty years. How many people have cooked it for? What what the end result is that we will never know. Um, so I'll. Um, so I, that's, I'll leave it there for now. Right, uh, this, this is just sort of a, a, a quick rundown. Is why, why is it important? Yeah, and, and it's fair to say that's just a, a quick piece of it because uh, I joked about you all solving our problems in your two hour time <laughs> frame. We all know that's not possible. So, you know, give us enough to know where we need to go from here. You, you started us there. So. Yeah. I guess what I would say, and um, as far as your ask, your initial ask is educate yourself. Mm -hmm. Understand who is, who we're talking about here, and the process involved uh, in making changes. Or uh, in the end, the only people that will finally do it with the legislature, but they, uh, some maybe respond a little bit better than others. Uh, a lot of your, because you're around the state. So there are people I'm talking to that have legislated that are getting the, the full force uh, argument from both sides. And they really are either uh, believing some of the things that are not entirely true that some of our uh, opponents of Medicaid expansion are uh, reporting, or they just don't know. Or they, and, and that's where you have got some input with them. If you can take them aside 
He's a small Wyoming county. I mean, they may be a member of your church. They may be, you know, a member of your car club, uh, <laughs> whatever. And uh, and that 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 has a, a, a benefit. So that would be my that that my answer. Thank you. Who wants to go next? Uh, he pointed at you, so Wendy. Sure. <laughs> um, any topics or? Areas of conversation you have questions about? Yes. Okay. Correct me if I'm wrong. Okay. Uh, One Health provides medical care for individuals who have insurance, sliding scale for those who do not have insurance. Is that a fair way to describe your operation? Yes. Okay. Second part of my interest is. Any statistics or even rough estimates of how many individuals, for instance, in a family situation, which I know about from a member of my own church, who was employed, his employer had insurance for him, but the family insurance was absolutely prohibitive. And so they, with three small children, wife and three small children, no insurance. How frequently is that a situation or scenario? Well, thank you for the question. I do not have any personal, like any data that I know of um, around that, except for anecdotal, like you mentioned. So you know of someone who that um, has had that experience. Or my local pastor, right? Mm -hmm. I could. Yes, I mean, no, and so um, unfortunately, that's not that I'm aware of data that we are actively collecting. Um, but potentially, I could look into and maybe ask some of our. I'm thinking while I'm talking. Um, I can talk to our clinics and find out if there's during the intake process as they're having those conversations with the patients, um, how they're um, you know getting this data and what we're kind of doing with it. But what I can say is, yes, One Health is, um, we do provide primary care behavioral health, which is something that I think is um, mm. wonderful and unique um, to our clinics. So we do have um, behavioral health support services. We also have something that I'm really um, excited about, um, what we call our community health workers. And so they are folks that, can help connect people, clients, patients, um, family members to local resources. So we work really closely with them um, to make sure that they're really aware of all the, the community resources that are available. And so if someone comes in and they need maybe some rent assistance or utility assistance, food assistance, we can connect them to, so it's kind of a, um, you may have heard this phrase before, but that um, no wrong door approach where you can come in to maybe for your vaccinations or your sports physical with your kids, and we can help set you up with um, a counseling appointment, um, connect you with um, food, food resources, clothing, whatever your particular needs might be. So there's lots of um, wrap around. Absolutely, that's exactly what we call it wrap around support services. So we do have a um, clinic in Powell. We have a clinic in Lovell, Brable, and Sheridan. We are opening up a clinic here in Cody um, in July, and that'll be um, here on Blackburn. So it's exciting that we can um, offer these services and support. And it is, a, like you said, it's a sliding scale. We do take insurance happily. Um, I hear that from the finance people will happily take the insurance, <laughs> but we also do have, um, again, that sliding scale that you mentioned um, for, um, for the family. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Is the PNA collecting anyone? It's not. Um, so what Roy is referring to is something that our state participates in every other year called um, the Prevention Needs Assessment. And that is administered through um, the University of Wyoming through their um, statistical analysis center. And what we do and how we support that um, is 
that survey is given in the schools and there's every other year so we're able to track trends around um, everything from um, first use of alcohol maybe or first use of nicotine any type of substances and then also there's a whole um, section on um, mental health and your um, wellness so we're really really looking at at that information um, we had 100% participation here in Park County with our schools. We, um, that survey is given to 6th, 8th, 10th, and 12th graders. 6th, 8th, 10th, and 12th graders. And then we're able to track trends. So um, we are hopeful that that, um, we had a little bit of a hiccup during COVID, as you can imagine. Um, so we had a kind of a, oh, I'm calling it a gap here with some data, but we um, are, are looking at some data being um, really good data for the state, but also for our community um, in the fall when that's, um, but I don't think that that is something that we would capture, you know. That is tough in this. It's hard to. I got you. Yeah. I'm looking for it. That's I know. And I'm, honestly, I'm going to have to think about that some more. And I don't 100% know that we aren't collecting that, but it's not something that I've had access to. In my role, so but I will um I'll ask because it's I'm curious. Yeah, because I I know there's a I'm pretty sure there's a statistic that says we have like 13 percent uninsured population across the state of Wyoming. Without I haven't yet been able to divvy that out in any way, shape, or form. Okay. okay. You know, is it children under the age of 18? Is it, you know, 21 to 28 years old or whatever? I, I haven't been able to suss that out. Okay. So that's that's part of the reason behind my question. All right. And I, I have some thoughts. So maybe um, before we wrap up today, I'll make sure to give you my contact information. And I have maybe some sources for you. Okay. So I'll, I'd love it. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. Do you know... How much of the state has something similar to one? I do not. I do not. That's a tough question. I was, yeah, I, I was thinking the same thing. Um, wrong. <laughs> federally qualified health centers. I don't know, Greg. I mean, I don't know if hmm. I know that one health, for example, like I said, we have clinics here in the Northwest, and I know that that was, um, I don't want to say a trend, but something that was. I mean, we're growing um, in our communities um, here in the Northwest part of Wyoming, but we also have several clinics in Montana. Mm -hmm. Again, really servicing and focusing on rural communities where um, those other providers and or support services might not be in place. So um, I do know that there are even some communities in Montana where public health services aren't available or aren't being staffed that we've been able to kind of contract with um, the counties and provide some of those just public health support services. So there's lots of layers to some of the work that we have going on. One program that I think is definitely worth mentioning that we have here in Powell is um, what we would call school-based mental health services. So one Health has partnered with school district number one, which is Powell, and we are able to provide behavioral health support services directly um, in the school. So what that does is um, it reduces tons of barriers, one being cost. So if there is a referral from um, a counselor or a teacher, I mean, the, and there's a process for it, then um, that student is able to, during the school day, um, receive mental health services. And so, um, again, we've reduced, you know, I can't, a parent might not be able to get them to an appointment or there might be some stigma. I mean, let's go ahead and call that out. There might be some stigma around it, but they're able to, you know, go to a, a mentoring appointment or, or whatever we're calling it and go down to the counseling office and receive those services. And we have seen a tremendous um use of, of, of that program and that partnership. Um, so much so that we're looking at expanding it into level and other counties are, I mean, I don't want to say clamoring for it, I won't speak for them, but they're very, very interested and 
There's lots of um, federal funds out there to help support some of this. Um, so it's a it's a program and a, a grant initiative through the Wyoming Department of Education. Um, and again, we're working with these partners like One Health to bring these providers directly into the um, schools. But it's it's a win win. And as just here through One Health, the parts of the state is right in the do not have. Um, there are other states, um, other excuse me, um, counties that are participating. The grant is it's, it's called Project Aware, and I know that they were piloting it um, in I want to say four to five counties. There is a school district and it's through the school districts, and then they partner with their local health care provider or mental mm -hmm. behavioral health provider. So again, Powell, um, there's a district in Love and Lander. Excuse me, there's a district in Campbell County. And those are the three that I can think of off the top of my head. But we will, um, I can also. Let's take a look at the common denominator. What Greg is talking about, if you've got an uninsured or underinsured family, mm -hmm. and when do that mental health appointments take place? During the normal work day. Yeah. They mm -hmm. can't take the day off work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Take it out. Out. It's a double whammy. Right. Mm -hmm. It is a double whammy. And it, it, it will continue to expand in some ways with the behavioral health reform that the state is going through right now. And they're focusing a lot of the funding towards those people that are already criminally justice involved. So the sliding scale that was offered to your county mental health, some of that is going to go away because those funds are no longer available to those that are not in the system already. So the concept of, of helping those that are in the system to change is great, but what about the upstream, those that are not in the system yet that need help if those funds aren't available in the same yeah. And I would offer, you know, what about, yes, like, like all of them voice Roy said, what about those families that are, you know, trying to do all the right things and, and give their kids those support services early and give them into those counseling services early. So it's this, Dance that we're constantly doing with this work can be yeah. frustrating. But again, we're balancing concern and hope. That's the way I do business. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's lots of things to be concerned of um, around this work in Wyoming. Um, but I'm also very hopeful because there's a lot of good things happening as well. So we're going to just keep chugging along. <laughs> All right, I've talked enough. <laughs> All right. Well, I mean, I can keep talking really long. <laughs> now, as far as the, the schools are concerned, now uh, ISPO, which used to be, which is a is a, a group, you know, mental health center, a mental health centers that has coalesced from um, New Orleans level and Cody, all three of the county, have now coalesced their county health services, health, county mental health services. Uh, as a group now, but they're in schools as well. Absolutely, absolutely. And they are, I think they're gonna be the ones that may be the most impacted by the the changes that are happening at state level, changing the funding from people that uh, are without insurance to people with, uh, um, that have a, are in the criminal justice system already, which is great, but Logic would it would seem to tell us that it would be cheaper and better to treat people before they get into the criminal justice system. Yeah. So um, those I mean, those are all those are, the, those organizations are going to need funding, and uh, they're just going to have to be. And I don't know how this is all kind of new. This one help is sort of new to me, and this, and Oxbow was is, is relatively new as, as well. I think we're just going to find our way to how to coordinate these services because we they are. I mean, it's, it's absolutely uh, great that uh, that they're some they're both in the schools. We're just going to have to figure out how to. to well, that. and to follow up on what Greg's saying, he's exactly right. So there's a framework being established. So we're we we piloted with some of these districts who are like very innovative in their thinking. Probably had you know, really open-minded administrators or superintendents have said, you know what, hey, we want to pilot this. This is a good thing for our kids and for our families. And then what's happened is, so for example, in Powell, um, it's gone really well. They've had, they've seen enormous success with the program. So then they all talk, right? So Cody's like, wait a minute, we want to participate. And maybe they get the grants, maybe they don't, 
but like Greg mentioned, they said, well, even if we don't, we still want to participate. We see the frameworks there. Hey, Oxbow, as the community mental health provider, what can you do? Can you help us, you know, kind of recreate this framework, this model in the Cody schools? And they said, absolutely. So we're working on what that looks like as well. So the, that's kind of a beautiful thing in that it's kind of what a pilot project, you know, should be doing, right? So setting, you certainly hope, that's you certainly hope right? So then we, we kind of work out some of the kinks and then we go, okay, great. Now let's take this and we figured it out, let's implement it here. And maybe we can do some really good things over here as well. And then continue to have that, that grow and, and be replicated across the state. So that is the hope. And it's really exciting to be part of those conversations. Um, I, like Greg, um, we're board members of Oxbow, which again used to be Yellowstone Behavioral Health, our, our community mental health center. And now um, we um, are trying to be you know, very much part of these, of these conversations. But there's so much happening at the state level that sometimes you feel like that's your full-time job, just paying attention to what's happening at the, um, with the legislators and, mm -hmm. and their lack of awareness around mental health. And yes, I said that on camera, <laughs> and I probably shouldn't have. <laughs> Warren, you taught me, you've taught me well. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say, education, education, education. education. <laughs> and we do try to provide as much around the topics. We have, um, you know, great executive directors that are, are doing that work, but us as community members, you know, that's one of the re one of the things that I hope that we do well at our community coalition level is that we can have these conversations and we can give our community members some two or three talking points. So when they are out having coffee with a, um, a friend, a colleague, a church member, they can say, hey, did you really know that, you know, maybe they heard this rumor, but it's actually more like this, this, and this. And we can kind of offset some of this misinformation like um Greg was kind of alluding to earlier. So and just to add to that a little bit, I may have quoted this last year, but one senator we had, Senator Kale Case from Fremont County, who was in a discussion that was in about health issues. And he just said flat out you got it all know this. The legislature doesn't know anything about mental health <laughs> and they really aren't interested. And that's a scary thing that you're in. Terrifying for me. Yeah. I mean, as a, you know, this is our job. I mean, this is what we do. We're, I mean, again, we, I've spent 10 years, more actually, working in prevention and trying to, again, when we talked about if we could get upstream, I mean, how much, you know, cost savings could we have? I mean, we have the data on that. I mean, but we're, our decision makers are not necessarily interested in facts. So um, we are, boy, I'm really going to take it. Let me step in at the garden. Okay. Um, <laughs> you, you in the are you going to testify? Anymore? Oh, yes. They don't have to testify anymore. <laughs> I'm interested in finding out yeah. more about the, the school health okay. program. School My husband's a, a junior high math teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, I call him a missionary to the deep, dark jungles of junior high. <laughs> and yes, he does speak a different language called math. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, we hear his horror stories when he's got to put up questions. Yeah, that's that's important. It is not important. just not just a um, um, the society pay part and the prevention part, but because this affects my family, <laughs> of course. And we can't expect our teachers to be counselors. I mean, we can give them the tools. In, in some of the work that we do, um, we do a lot of community trainings. So it's all about how can we train our community to recognize signs of um, somebody in a mental health crisis okay. or um, suicide. I mean, if if we're worried about someone, how can we empower our community to um, connect that loved one, that friend, that colleague, that client um, that's to, cool. that's exactly, to the appropriate professional resources and help. Oh well, yeah, because when your math teacher is teaching math, they don't, Really have the time to no solve the, solve all that kid's problem? Yeah, of course not. Yeah. But if we notice 
and we use this is the kind of language that I choose to use in these trainings. If I notice some changes in my students' behavior, how can I connect with that student and connect them at that point to the appropriate professional resources and making sure that your husband and all the teachers know what those resources are in the community. The signs to look at. Right. And those signs are so incredibly important. It, it, in a way, then, it's like uh, some of the efforts now the training the community as a whole what to look out for for suicide. Uh, people who are thinking about suicide and what to do if you recognize those signs. Absolutely. So we have several broadening it out. Yep. Mm -hmm. it's several trainings that we offer um, here, but also they're offered by my colleagues across the state. So we have something that we call maybe our gatekeeper. It's our um, hour and a half um, to two hour training called QPR. Yep. So it's question, persuade, refer. And it's really, I mean, pretty much how to ask that direct suicide question. But again, we're, we also discuss myths around suicide, but also um, warning signs, clues, those types of things. Um, we also have a mental health first aid, and we have two um, trainings. That's about an eight hour training. Um, I just completed two of them this week, as a matter of fact. But um, we have two, we have one for adults, and then we have one for um, people who work directly with youth. Because that's a, those are going to look and feel a little bit differently, right? Um, and then Roy, I, I think we'll talk about in a few minutes, there's actually um, mental health first aid for public safety. So those are for all of our first responders. And um, I won't steal his thunder on that. But then um, the last training that I think is important for me to mention is um, ASSIST. And that's the acronym. You know, we love an acronym in this work. But um, it's Applied Suicide Intervention Skills Training. So it's not spelled real assist, but uh, it is a two-day training and it's much more in depth. Um, I'm a certified assist trainer and it's, um, I mean, to me, I wouldn't have become a trainer if I didn't believe in it. It's, it's one of the best. And if you've had the opportunity to take it, great. If you haven't um, and you like the opportunity, they happen across the states. Um, several times a year, so I'm happy to. We'll be bringing them back in the fall. Um, the same, right? Yes, yes the same. I'll let you know when we're hosting them, and um, we'd love to have you as part of our um, our training. If you're interested, it's a great it's a, it's a great workshop. If, um, have you taken it? Great, wonderful. That's where I know you from. <laughs> <laughs> so the um, again, those are ones that, and it's really I feel those are for community members. I mean, they are for I would say assist is for those community members that may be encountering people in crisis. And again, how can we keep people in our community safe for now and get them to the appropriate um, professional support and services? It's not how can we fix all the problems? We're not asking people to, you know, do the surgery, you know, do the CPR, then do the surgery, then do the no, we're just saying how can we connect people to those, whatever that appropriate professional help is in their community. So no, I'd love, I'd love to I would also add mm -hmm. Brian right mental health first aid for adult that was focus. Absolutely, and that was incredibly well received. Can you say more about that then? I want to say more about that. <laughs> <laughs> we had a, um, so it was mental health first aid, and we had it for youth and adults, actually, and we have um, a trainer in our, he's not here in our state, but he um, is in our database, I guess. I mean, he's in Colorado, out of Colorado, but he came in and he has, he was able to offer um, a faith-based perspective on these trainings. And what I can say is we were able to do, um, three trainings all together, maybe four, but we had a private funder here in our county who said the mental health and faith were very important to him, and so he underwrote the training for us, um, but we, uh, what I would offer is we were able to get um, several people to the trainings, and we had, I bet we trained, I have the numbers in my reporting, probably about 120 total for all the trainings, um, that were, would have never attended one of my regular community trainings otherwise. Okay. And Roy did attend to that. The curriculum mm -hmm. is the same. Yes. But able to bring some scripture mm -hmm. to 
back up the concepts that are being put out there. Yeah. Is it NAMI based? Is it top no. or someone else? Oh, okay. so training went to us all soul. So soul training. No, um, soul shop. Soul shop. Yeah, that's right. And so, and then we brought that also in conjunction with soul shop. So yeah. um, it sounds much. Yeah, yeah. It was, and it was great. Mm -hmm. Like I said, it was an opportunity for us to kind of get in front of the faith communities and do my little commercial about some of the things that we do. Hopefully, we add them if they can't attend our meetings. That's fine with me. Um, the more the merrier. But if they can get on my newsletter list and find out about all the things coming up, they we can all share information. That's a win for me. Sure. Yeah. Would you say all these trainings and whatnot that are going on have helped reduce the suicide rate in Wyoming? Because I, I last heard a couple weeks ago, we're down to number three. We, and so thank you for sharing that. So we have been in the top three for the past. Yeah, I know. We're down. That's good. We, yeah. we are. I mean, we have yeah. replaced it's around with Montana and Alaska. Right. right. Um, so we that is the latest thing that um, we have heard as well. We were discussing that. And I would like to think, yes, our numbers. So when we move a uh, when we move a percentage or we move it is huge because our numbers are our population is so small. Mm -hmm. But it also impacts us the other way if we have um a surge. So we do know that our numbers are lower. Um last reported numbers are lower. I would love to think that some of the work that we're doing is having an impact on that. That would be amazing. I would also attribute some of this to 988. So our lifelines, the fact that we were able to um, have two lifelines here in Wyoming that are manned by Wyoming residents. So when a Wyoming person, and I have to give you the caveat that it has to be in that 307 area code, because right now that's how it works, the geotracking. Somebody from the 307 area so calls, they will get one of our Wyoming lifelines. So that's something that we have worked incredibly hard for. And yeah. it's um we have seen um how do folks get training to be on those calls? There is an extensive amount of training that they go through because um both of those lifelines have to be or are, I don't know if they have to be, I think they would, um accredited. So there's a, um, through the accreditation process, there are several trainings that they do um, and professional trainings that they do attend. They are not counselors, so keep that in mind. They are, um, I would say, highly trained employees and professionals. Mm -hmm. And then they're also um, working very closely with 211. So how to connect people to resources. So they're able to de-escalate they're able to connect people um, and to connect people to local resources. I think the other profound thing about that, so I, I've got a war issue in the, oh boy. I can't say out of things to keep getting involved in stuff. <laughs> yeah, we call that the war in effect. And so <laughs> I'm the board chair of the coalition. Before Yellowstone Behavioral joined Oxbow, I was the board president there, so I'm bouncing back and forth between both of them. But the 98 thing, they have when you call if if you're if you're a Native American press one, if you're veteran press two. So they're connecting you with resources from your world also. Okay. Which is important. Very. And I was pleased to give that one for that. And did we ever identify the other faith based training? With soul shop, but there was another. It, it's just mental health first aid um, with that faith based lens. So, um, so who offered it? It was um, we we helped bring it here, um, but again, it was underwritten by an anonymous donor. So, um, but there are some a trainer that came in who had that um, that training component. He had that training. What's the word I'm looking for? That professional designation that he would be thank you. Okay. Um, so, um, but I can find out, I can definitely find out more information for you and get you his contact information. That would be great. Thank you. Absolutely. Roy, tell us about your work. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So, I'm, I'm going to go back to where we started on issuing those challenges. I'm sure at some point in time, I can't imagine Warren has not spoke about 
Betty Wood. <laughs> yeah. Yes. We're talking about the next exit. So, just spoiler alert, you know, in recognizing that law enforcement and the faith community being pillars of the community, being able to join together in our work can be more impactful to the community. So, I want to throw that out there. There's so much work taking place at the state level, so, you know, as, we, as we just talked about what the state was, but there, there's a lot of well-intentioned people with a lot of work going on in the state. So one thing I'm involved with right now is uh, suicide mortality review. And it's a conversation that has taken place in the state, but most of our counties are not large enough to actually put a team together. And, and after a suicide is completed, uh, all in a little bit of healing time, but then an interview can be conducted with the family. Mm -hmm. There's a review of the case and the case study from a law enforcement lens, from a therapist lens, from a lived experience lens, all, the, all those stakeholders coming together and looking at this case and trying to find common denominators that are taking place across the state. Um, mm -hmm. That's not a work that's been a lot of done historically in Wyoming. We know what happens. We all think we know why. But for somebody to be collecting all of the specifics and see, okay, here's a common denominator. And then we can feed that to our prevention folks that we could address yeah. in the field to try That's to get screened. And see. how long has that been going? Uh, we just attended a conference in Phoenix two months ago. So it's a fairly new it's effort. It's a very new effort. So Laramie County has been doing it for quite a while. They have a, a pretty active team yeah. in Laramie County. And so they have come to the table with us. We're looking at how we can build potentially regional teams oh. so that there would be enough data to be able to take that not only from the subject matter experts but also from because we talk about how higher our mortality rate is from suicide in reality most of our counties don't have a lot that take place individually so to be able to pull all those together and have a regional team look at and address those and then feed that back we touched some of the mental health first aid for public safety being yet another component. The more people that we can train and educate to recognize stuff, to intervene. I, I would say if we move the mark, and again, this is anecdotally, but for 36 years of law enforcement, completed, the, the individuals in our communities that complete suicide, we normally have not had any contact with. It's not a standard mental health call that we're taking every day. It's somebody that wasn't even on the radar. Okay. So if we can train the people in their circle to recognize that, so that we can have that concept and get screen, that's that's the goal that needs to take place with all our training. Everybody has a seat at the table. It takes a community, right? We all have to come together and be able to see and recognize. It. I always refer. Have you ever heard of the book The Gift of Fear? Mm -hmm. By Gavin I, I, I recommend you read it. it, it <laughs> I recommend that all the time. It's an outstanding book, and the whole premise there is he gets into the psychology. He was working with victims of vital crime. And a common denominator he was hearing all the time was, if only there'd been a sign, if there if there'd been a clue, I wouldn't have done whatever I did to put me into this, this scenario. Well, as he talked about, there was always a sign. It's just our modern brains have disengaged our subconscious that picks up on it and explains it away. When we do that with the people that we interact with, on the street. How often do you say, you know, how are you? Good. Nobody answers that question, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, if you do, they look at you weak. <laughs> well, and quite often when we ask the question, we don't have the time to prepare for the answer. Or just say nothing. Walking the other direction while we're waiting for the response, right? I uh, had an exper a four year experiment where walking to work, didn't matter who I come into contact with, somebody would say, how are you? That's marvelous. And we press on. I finally, after four years, had a guy at a gas station in Gasperville. But that doesn't sound like this. That doesn't sound what's going on. Mm -hmm. and asked me about it. Mm -hmm. Actually, responded to it. It was like commendatory. It was, it was yeah. good because that we go through that walk every day. They present those opportunities and, and we don't ask the question. We don't follow up. We don't follow through. We don't really want to answer it. So I wanted to mention CIT, crisis intervention teams. Um, we have, I think, six counties that have crisis intervention training portion of the team. So we're developing the team. It's, it's a team component. The team is law enforcement, mental health, people with lived experience, 
and the murder people who experienced some anatomy, your support groups that are in there, and uh, your hospitals, your medical community. That's the program part where we're all sitting down and identifying gaps in the system and then working together in a concerted effort to get through that, that portion. The training part is law enforcement gets 40 hours of mental health training. It's, it's a full week. Um, they learn about all the different psychosis that they might come into contact with in the field. Again, like Wendy talks about, we don't teach them to be the counselor to address the deal and write the script, but to recognize what is happening and then be able to interact with them in that crisis to be able to de-escalate and to get them into that, that help that they need. So we've been doing CIT in Park County since 2008. We were one of the first counties to have it. We've helped spread it across the state. Graduate. Yeah, it's very good. good. It's, 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 it's fantastic. Uh, we've been working a lot with CIT International in, in changing their thought process. CIT is a wonderful program, but it was for a 2009 police department. Oh. Also, giving them to understand that 95% of agencies in the United States are not big enough to do what they're doing. So, we're working on evolving that process to make it fit better. There is another challenge. There's a seat at that table for our faith community to be a part of that, that CIT. The faith of blue conversation, it all comes in place if we're all talking ahead of time before there's a critical incident, we're able to respond better to those as one with a unified message and conversation. Wow, I jumped way off the public safety. Anyway. <laughs> no, it's not. Don't help her shape the public safety. Keeping people alive feels like yeah. public safety. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I thought it was about me as the connection. <laughs> the eight hour training she referenced with mental health first aid, the public safety component includes about two hours of uh, peer support and self care. Mm -hmm. wow. Law enforcement continues to be one of the highest careers in the nation as far as suicide rate. The amount of stress that's there that we don't even recognize. You know, you hear the stories, and they'll probably talk something. I, you know, strong built the camel back, but that one more thing that that vicarious trauma. We now know that every interaction we have with the victim, that that law enforcement officer, that EMS person, walks away and carries a part of that trauma as a part of them forever. They say that the average person may experience three to five critical incidents in a lifetime, an officer will experience 60 to 70. And so trying to get us screen with that, because again, who who rescues the rescuers? You know, so we need to get out. We need to assist them so that they can better serve their communities for everybody that's involved in the conversation. Uh, so the statewide presence is huge. And so everybody needs to be around these tables and having these conversations when we have these chances, because as was touched on our legislators, they, they don't know. And if they hear four different messages from four different groups, then they have to make a really hard decision. So what we did here in Park County, when I became chief in Powell, I would get seven lunch, my lunch meeting invites every month to a prevention group. And I didn't have time for seven meetings a month. And I bounced around with different ones, and, and half the people, you know, war was every one. <laughs> half the people sitting around the table were the same ones that were at the last meeting. And then when you and I were talking, and I was like, you know what? Simple cop mindset, but if I go to a domestic violence call, a serious domestic violence call, more than likely at some point in time, there's been a sexual assault. There's usually alcohol involved. Probably a controlled substance. They they all intertwine in my room. Why are we not sitting around the table as one and seeing how we can assist each other? How can our different programs back up the other program as opposed to having seven different messages that truly have the same end goal and it's coming at a different group? How can we do that locally? And we were able to combine all seven organizations into one, which became Healthy Park County. Uh, <laughs> Same thing, you know, as we try to move those efforts forward at the state level, so that when the legislators hear Medicare is important, but they're not just hearing from the docs, they're hearing the same conversation from mental health, they're hearing the same conversation from law enforcement, they're hearing the same conversation from database, because we all have a different perspective that makes it important. 
But then it puts it puts the legislature in trying to pick one or the other as opposed to being able to have that, that one message. So that is my role for Blastop now, is to try and connect some dots to, to bring I, I work with one community that's struggling in the area, and I go to another community and here they they solve that. Well, how come nobody's talking over here? Well, one of the most valuable lessons I learned in the military was if you come to a minefield, well, you guys know this, it's pretty face too. If you come to a minefield and there's a set of footprints leading all the way across the minefield, don't make your own path. Walk yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, let's connect the dots yeah. and, and put us all on the same path. Yes. So I hear you talking about self care. And I'm, I'm aware, having been a caregiver of a parent who was dying, a parent who had dementia, okay? I, my advice when someone talks to me, I say, take care of yourself. You can't make a good decision if you're not in a good place. Now, I don't exactly know what that means for different individuals. You would have said that self-care would not necessarily be the same for me as it might be for you. One of my questions is, how can we, as faith-based groups, provide some of that assistance for healthcare? Because I'm, I'm thinking about, if you go out to an accident and there's a dead body or a dismember or whatever, okay, how can we help you work through that or is there no way i mean i i'm serious i'm not just doing pie in the sky scenario i'm asking how can we help provide some of that assistance does that make sense from a law enforcement perspective i would say connected know us first we we especially in this day and age we live in a society of and we're very fortunate when we well, still a great place but we're still impacted by the national agenda, by the national news, by the the number of nobody ever comes to you and says things are going good. The only time we hear from people is when it's going bad, right. unhappy with something. I was a movie that came out in the eighties or nineties. SWAT, you know, and you're like, uh, well, street sometimes do with the right things, not doing the right thing. What does that mean? <laughs> so we go out into our communities charged with the tasks that our community pays us to do, they expect us to follow through, and then we get railed on for them. Mm -hmm. So most officers will make light of, you know, when somebody says thank you for your service, or drop cookies off at the PD, or whatever. But internally, it's a healing process because somebody's acknowledging that your work matters, mm -hmm. that, that, that we recognize you are here for us. And in my agency, I always rotate officers. I didn't allow them to go on night shift for two years mm -hmm. because for two years, then you're dealing with a totally different population. You're dealing with that 5% of the population that's been 95% of our time. Mm -hmm. And it skews your perspective. So you get them on day shift and get them out walking around in town. I require once a week, Fifth Street is our main street in power. Once a week, when you're on day shift, I want you to walk Fifth Street. I want you to go in the stores, I want you to talk to people, I want you to walk around, but I want you to have contact with, with uh, that 95% of our community. Thank you, public. Thank you, public. I'm throwing punches. I say do a full time in that relationship. It's not a law enforcement call, not a law enforcement whatever, but just acknowledging the presence. And then being aware and recognizing uh, Signs, symptoms, you do know a first responder that you see a change in behavior, you see what's coming. Because we all have it, we just don't know it. Um, that, that conference I went to in the lab was focused on, you know, that you should be spending your time in a community doing just what you've just said, getting to know who those people are, listening to them. Listen to them. Yeah. And if you can do that, the point was is your job. Much easier and much more well, it, It's amazing, absolutely. That's, that's the other side of you. It's absolutely amazing what somebody will tell you face to face on the street that they never would have called to you. I was explaining this, you know, you ever put a jigsaw puzzle together without the corner pieces? Or the, you know, <laughs> and so something that's small enough in somebody's mind to not call it a fort, 
But a side story might be that corner piece, it might be that edge that helps you be able to put stuff together. But the the auspice of so I'm a big Sorrow Field fan. Uh, Nobody knows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, he was Bobby, right? He, he was the founder of pretty much modern day police in like eighteen hundred. Uh, you're like his. <laughs> and, and that's why that's why they that's why the group's police called Bobby's after Sir Robert Bush. Yeah, but okay. it, he said, you know, the public are the police, the police are the public. The only difference between you and me is I get paid to do full time. Let's expect the bonus. That that community law enforcement connection has been lost in a lot of parts of our country, and we see the challenges because of that. You know, it, it it's a two way street. It's a two way street. It is, and law enforcement loses sight of that also. And I'm, I'm I get try to keep going. I don't want to be short. Yeah, I'm doing my soapbox and, and not still under tonight. But if, if you look at a, at a PAL PD badge, it says the city of PAL as opposed to PAL. Because to me, that was important. Um, everybody has heard the reference of a shield in reference to a badge. But most people, including my peers, don't know why. And do you know why we wear our badge where we wear it? Don't feel bad, most of my peers don't either. Because it's only hard. No. Yeah. It's reference is a shield we carry on that left side under the thought process of the of Roman Centurion shield. A Roman Centurion carried his shield in his left arm. Yes, most people are right hand, but he carried it in his left arm and it didn't protect him. It protected the guy standing in his left. Mm -hmm. So your community is that person to the left. That's why I want the city of Powell instead of just Powell. That's what that shield is all about. Mm -hmm. But when you lose the heart and mindset as to why we do what we do, both from a community perspective and from an officer perspective, it creates marriage. So, in that same Congress, the went through this process of being can be one of two kinds of a police officer. One is the warrior, the other is the guardian. Mm -hmm. The neighbor pushing just yeah, the guardian. Yeah, it's the guardian. And when I will say in Powell, it's been what six years ago when there were officers getting assassinated in the cars. It still happened some, but it was happening on a regular basis around the nation. We had built a relationship in our community to the point where you would walk away from giving somebody a citation for speeding. They'd say, you know, we got your back, right? We had built that relationship. One of my first goals as chief when I walked in the door was I wanted to hear the community of Powell refer to us as our police department, not the police department. Mm -hmm. And we reach that. And and that it takes us all. Mm -hmm. and, uh, did that kind of answer your question? Did I just go all over the map? No. no. <laughs> because I, like I said, I, I'm, I'm thinking about it from, because I live outside the city. Okay. So I'm in a different scenario. But by the same token, I. I shop in Powell, I worship in Powell, I go to the doctor in Powell. So that means that I'm part of the Powell community. Mm -hmm. And and so I'm thinking, how can I or how can I help my faith community provide some mm -hmm. support mm -hmm. that maybe isn't necessarily happening on a regular basis? Right. We, we've had some, some of our churches have been very, very supportive over the years. They've all been open. But but just stopping in, you know, talking to us on the street, it, it building that relationship. You know, when we go to the prevention conferences and, and people ask, "Well, how do you get a cheap piece at the table?" And what I tend to tell people is, "Know know me first before you can learn to ask. Build a relationship." I think another piece is having the officers in the school has. I guess you'd say demystify, perhaps, mm -hmm. some of the conceptions, misconceptions, et cetera, and, and has made it easier for perhaps some of us to reach out. It's it's been been or for maybe even the Johnson. We're, the other thing I hear from the mention all the time is we're, we're not good about telling our story or saying our phrases, and, and a lot of course things the same way. You know, I can't tell you how many of my guys over the years I've watched 
out of their own pocket, buy somebody a meal, buy somebody gas, buy somebody groceries. I watched a 22 year old, well, I didn't watch, I heard a 22 year old officer stopped the lady on Gilbert Street because she had a kid now somewhere out of the back seat that should have been a person. Brand new officer, his first year on the street, interacts with this lady. And it turns out right across the street from this traffic stop was a garage sale, the yard sale. And they had a car seat on the yard sale. And so he walked over there and bought that car seat and put it in her car. And I think she got a warning instead of a ticket. But the biggest thing is he addressed the issue. You know, our, our whole whole goal and focus of law enforcement should be changing behavior. It's not about the ticket. You better jump in here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I was just going to say, I'm trying to think of ways that you uh, uh, Medicaid in the conversation we, we have in here. And I guess I see where uh, making like healthcare and mental health care. Uh, available to everybody, at least available to everybody in the population, kind of changes the context of where mental health is treated. Like right now, where are the first responders for mental health? Is the schools? Is the police officers? Uh, and uh, where is mental health treated? Prisons. Uh -huh. Uh, it, uh, I see this as a way to get in on the, you know, the bottom line as far as helping uh, people be healthy because it's real hard to be mentally healthy with you're not physically healthy. So I don't need needs. And this and ex expanding Medicaid gives funds provides funds for mental health, physical health, you know, and, and like these uh, federally qualified health centers, you know, a great idea, uh, but they run on money too. <laughs> and if their sliding scale is dealing with people that have no money beyond grocery money or rent money, then their sliding scale gets pretty low. I don't know if it ever goes to zero, uh, but, uh, you to have a to have a uh, you know no money no mission you know uh, no margin no mission so this also keeps these kind of clinics up and running. Um, it's sometimes uh, we get accused of being kind of uh, more concerned about uh, you know. Uh, pie in the sky ideas of everybody being healthy and that sort of thing. But uh, one thing that does appeal to a lot of people in Wyoming and legislature is just dollars and cents. And Medicaid expansion will has the potential to bring in around $100 million a year. In and the save state. us $500 million? No what? And save us five hundred million. I'm just picking a figure. Right. You know, Look at the statistics in a city of Denver in terms of how much money they spend in the emergency room versus housing people who are homeless. It's, there's no question that Medicaid would make a difference. Yes, and uh, the, the, question, the only question is, is how much is that going to be? You know, and from my perspective, looking at working in a hospital, as a hospitalist at the end of my career, we would see repeat offenders, repeat, if not offenders, that repeat frequent people who repeatedly admitted. Flyer. There is a frequent flyer, mm -hmm. and, and it's repeatedly admitted for the same or similar problems. And you just go, why? And well, if you don't have enough money to pay for your medicine, you're, uh, 
you're not going to be buying medicine. And if you don't take your medicine and you get a chronic illness, you will eventually wind up in the hospice at, at uh, enormous expense. Mm -hmm. It's just this yeah. cycle. Exactly. We, we, we have been dealing for that for years. So we've uh, been saving a buck on not paying uh, things ahead of time and paying a thousand dollars to for repeated hospitalization. So, and also, I mean, it's still basic economics. When you bring a hundred million dollars into a state, and who, where does that money go? It goes to respiratory therapists, physical therapists, nurses, nurses' aides. It goes through this higher yeah. pharmacist, doctors. Uh, you could have a productive person instead of carving gangrenous pieces off of somebody who can't pay for the diabetes medicine every every six months. Exactly, but uh, strictly economic basis, just it, uh, and that money turns over. And, and this is, I guess, why I, the reason why I bring this up is because it is sometimes a, a, a helpful approach to some people that say, well, we just can't afford it. And we say, well, we can't afford to take care of all of our, you know, sick people. Well, the fact of the matter is, you can't afford not to. One physician, you know, wrote an email to me, and um, and number two, this is not this is not new people coming on to the healthcare uh, require you know requiring healthcare. Everybody in this room is a patient or has been a patient, or I mean, there that there's no in this modern day, you you can't get away from it. A friend of mine said, I, I, I'm going to go a little off to the side a little bit. Friends of mine at the cowboy, and we were reminiscing together, thinking, you know, maybe we were just born too late. God, we could have been born in the 1800s. We could be riding horses, and chasing cows. And, <laughs> God, life would have been good. Oh. And, then we <laughs> and then we started, then we started looking at our medical history and said, well, we could be in wheelchairs, we'd be blind. <laughs> we would not have the use of at least one extremity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, no, uh, going back to that, uh, not being patients is, is just not an option. So that's what, you know, that's what we're, where we're at. But another, uh, and, but sometimes legislatures actually respond better to that. And and the short version on that is over the ten years I've been fooling around trying to you know get this stuff passed. We've lost a billion dollars with a B in the state of Wyoming of funds coming into the state of Wyoming, and incidentally. For the folks that will that say, well, I don't want my tax dollars, you know, going to this stuff. Well, buddy, your tax dollars are still going to other states. Yeah. Because that billion of that billion dollars is going to other states that have expanded Medicaid and we're paying their bill. We're just not getting the benefits. So how far away legislatively? Do we seem to be from actually taking the Medicaid expansion? You know, it, it depends on year to year basis. And and almost and honestly, that's that's kind of a full time job to track those folks those okay. folks. Uh, mm -hmm. and there's a couple of deal you know, like I can give us one. I mean, there's Better Wyoming and uh, Healthy Wyoming are programs that that's basically what they do. They try to make changes at the legislature, intervene the legislative level. And okay. uh, they have newsletters that keep, will keep you informed of what's going on. So either one of those are great. Um, I mean, yeah. just so you can kind of keep up on where we are legislatively and kind of giving some report cards about mm -hmm. this. Uh, and what, and what, what, in Wyoming, and what was the other one? Better Wyoming. Better Wyoming. They're they're tied together. You can Google them, or I can give you the. And I've got links too. Um, so yes, there. Uh, as, to answer your question, we were very close a couple of years ago. Yeah. And uh, 
there uh, they, they just couldn't get it across the, the finish line where there's enough people that simply uh voted on their ideology without any real understanding of the question and um i would say one other thing about dealing with legislators it might be a more effective to really not look at this as a uh, a partisan issue. It, it really isn't, and it, it never was a partisan issue. A partisan issue between Democrats and Republicans, you know, those guys are going to be fighting themselves off. That's what it is. But from a practical point of view, trying to get health care to 25,000 people and bring in $100 million into the state of Wyoming every year is not a partisan issue. It's just, a, it's just a really good idea. Yeah. And we're not going to get this over the, the, the goal. It's going to be passed by Republicans. I mean, <laughs> we do live in Wyoming after all. Right. And, uh, and, and uh, you know, uh, there's Republic, the Republicans that have voted against uh, the Medicaid expansion for years eight, 10 years are, are going up and, and, and saying, we can't keep doing this. We got to fix this. We got to vote. We got to get Medicaid expanded in the state of Wyoming. And they're incrementally adding those people that, uh, that have that mindset of this is, A, it's not a partisan issue. It's not a competition. It's, a, it's our neighbors that we're trying to to uh, take care of and also make a lot of money, well, you know, or, like, you know, get some money into the state. We only got half a million people, and all half the people to waste. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's I mean, that's that's true. It's true. <laughs> it's just because um, we don't need some of these folks now. You know, and, and, uh, you know, we were talking about you know, um, police officers, you know, uh, needing to take care of yourself. Yeah. You know, physicians, I, my, most, my experience is with physicians. And like police officers, they have a, one of the highest rates of suicides. Mm -hmm. And and I can tell you part of that is because we are put in a position where uh, we are trying to solve the world's problems without giving, not having the tools. Not enough resources. And uh, the physicians traditionally have and people they don't have any money they they, don't, they just go without being paid and uh, they all barter my my dad was a dentist and he used to he's taking horses for dentists or for, for dentists my god those horses were horrible <laughs> they did when you get your dentist made you give your dentist a horse you don't give him the cream of the crap <laughs> So, uh, chicken and eggs might be better. <laughs> but then it would have been cheaper if it had done it for free. <laughs> but that isn't the way he, that isn't the way he worked. Uh, but anyway, uh, the not being able to help people because they don't have the wherewithal to help themselves is an extremely stressful situation. And uh, even in clinics, you know, like uh, Heritage Clinic, great idea. They're, they're, they're giving reduced cost for provision of medical care, but they can't do uh, all that needs to be done. They're not doing emergency services and the urgent care. I mean, it's it's primary care. And the hospitals are, yeah, I mean. And they're not doing hard cats. No, they're not. Yeah, and they're not hospitalized. No. I mean, they're not anywhere to be found when no. somebody gets into, into the hospital situation. Mm -hmm. And But they are in that situation where they have to coordinate that care. So whether you're in private practice and just understand that some people ain't going to be able to pay you, or if you're working with heritage, where you're going to get you're going to get a paycheck, but the patient's going to get reduced price. The bottom line is, is they need care by physical therapists, respiratory therapists, specialists, 
orthopedic surgeons, heart surgeons, and none of those folks work for free. And you are tasked with trying to get them to work for free. And that is a very stressful situation. And physicians will not, eventually will not come to a state where they have to do that. They will come to it, they will practice in a state where they're saying, I'm gonna send you down the street. It's gonna take you a while before we can get you in, but we can get you in with that cardiologist in a couple, you know, couple of weeks. And not trying to figure out how to get in with the cardiologist for free. The other, uh, kind of one last thing, there are uh, a lot of folks that, uh, or there are sources of information, I guess, that are adamantly opposed to uh, Medicaid expansion. And I've got their website too, actually. Uh, the, uh, it's uh, an organization called the uh, Foundation. Uh, uh, Foundation for Government Accountability. You can Google that one too. Which sounds wonderful. And it is. Uh, they and they uh, have pretty much. They have a lot of reasons where how Medicaid, why Medicaid should not be expanded, and a lot of it is uh, claims that hospitals will go under by the overwhelming new, uh, number of new low-paying patients. You also have to remember that Medicaid pays very poorly. Uh, and they, they're, they're not too bad as far as their things and stuff like that, but they don't, they just don't pay that great. But they, but in my book, some money is better than no money. So that is one of the, I think the main things that, that's, you know, they point out that Medicaid doesn't pay as well as private insurance. However, as far as the support from hospitals and physicians and uh, organizations that provide medical care, they're, they say that they are just all going to go broke because they're going to get run over with all these patients. And I'm not smart enough to be able to, you know, I've looked at their studies and they've got a lot of information. I'm not smart enough to sort it all out. What I'm smart enough to understand is the Medicaid expansion is supported by the Wyoming Hospital Association, Wyoming Medical Association, the Wyoming Academy of Family Physicians, Wyoming Academy of Pediatrics, Wyoming Heart Association. And I find it hard to believe that those professional organizations would be adamantly in favor of uh, something that is going to put them out of business. So I can kind of just fly over the top on some of that stuff. Uh, and, um, and I don't know if that works all that well, legislators, but, but most of the people in this state, I mean, even, in, uh, well, we've all, we all, I don't know why only, we all know what I'm talking about. Uh, but they are inherently, they inherently care about their neighbor. They inherently care to make the state a better place. If somebody's had an accident on the side of the road, Wyoming's a place to have it happen because somebody's going to stop and check in. And, and I think we have to appeal to that part of Wyoming and, and just stay the heck away from them. Uh, from part of the poly politics as, as best we can. So that's sort of my two cents. I think the personal stories, right? If you can, if you can share a personal story that that's can influence. That's, uh, yeah, that's actually, and, that's, and as far as dealing with legislators or um, particularly with legislators, and because if they're on the, the on the fence, and they're talking to somebody that isn't reporting what they heard, but is talking to somebody that has experienced it, it is, is much more impactful. And interestingly, I, I 
been into a ton of meetings like this, but going to the, you know, with the meetings with uh, legislators and, uh, and Cheyenne and talking with my colleagues around the academy, uh, family physicians stuff. There's always somebody in that group that said, yeah, I was on Medicaid or should have been on Medicaid because I was trying to raise kids and had four jobs and uh, and it was just there, you know, and and there's there's somebody in, in, in every group and you know, that means it's pretty, it's way too common in Wyoming. Uh, and, they, and if folks that have that experience share it, that, and it, it's not, not very fun to share, honestly. Uh, but uh, and it's, and, but it, if it's if people are comfortable with that, then uh, they, they're they're very impactful. I think good to know too or be aware of the actual numbers. When we mm -hmm. talk about one hundred and fifty percent of poverty or two hundred percent of the national poverty levels, that sounds like a lot more than it is. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. I was, I was shocked to hear what the actual number was. What is the actual number? Uh, what's the actual number? Okay. <laughs> um, now, this is a year old. I think they're, it's a, maybe a little bit higher, but 100% of poverty level is 1,200. 100% uh, of poverty level is 1,237 a month for a single person, 2,500 a month for a family of four. Uh, so, that gets that, I mean, that that's the to make a living. So when I used to hear 100 percent poverty, in my mind I was thinking, okay, we're gonna give this somebody make fifty thousand dollars a year. Yeah. I, I, yeah. And so I hear an actual numbers as opposed yeah, to so, yeah. I think we need to make sure that we can be as practical as possible. So if there's an opportunity for us to say those numbers, then to say them. And and we pretty much know what rent is. Mm -hmm. virtually any part of the world and right. it's seven hundred dollars is probably yeah. median for a one-room shack in Powell and it's probably higher than that it's higher than that sir no there's <laughs> so if you've got you know if you're a single person and you're making a thousand bucks a month there's no car payment there's no food there's no gas there's no yeah if you're going to live someplace besides a tent well, it's, 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 to clarify that, that is the upper amount of money we're talking about. That's the the bottom of the Affordable Care Act is about 100 percent. Medicaid is below that. The people we're actually talking about are below that 100 percent poverty level, and down to for a single person, 529 dollars a month or 999 a month. For a family of four, so the math on that is not good. Uh, it, it, there is no practical way for and and and, and people. Uh, if if I've learned anything about human beings, they are adaptable. They simply adapt to that. You don't get insurance, and you cross your fingers, hope that nothing serious happens. Now, in the family of four, Wyoming is respectful of children most of those times i don't believe there i don't believe there is a coverage gap for children with uh chip there's still a coverage gap of children no i said that with the chip program, no, what is the, chip program? Exactly. the chip program covers the chip program is is an uh, addendum to basically well you may know more about it it's like a child health insurance program. So if, if all children are, um, if their parents apply, I mean, again, there's some, you know, things that have to happen, but it's coverage for um, children is available. Even if the parents cannot afford it, their children can have, um, it's like a state program. It's like an expansion Medicaid. It is, actually. It's a, it's a Medicaid program. So our program. kids are already covered. The kids are covered. It's just the 18 and above that are not. Correct. The fallacy in that is how do you have healthy kids and sick parents? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Well, and that kids end up not going to school if their parents are chronically old, mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. on and yeah. so forth. Yeah, I mean, those you get the expansion um, as of what last year that uh, postpartum mothers postpartum, right. still get yeah. Medicaid for one year now. Yes, because it was like yeah. as soon as you have the baby, you stop being yeah. covered, and then you couldn't even get like lactation and go consultants or anything. So, to our legislators' credit, uh, they passed that not, yeah. not without discussion, but this is where Health of Wyoming and the Wyoming Cabinet versus, I mean, everybody's really. Came down because this was yeah. that, honestly a slam dunk uh, because the, the time the women were included after their delivery and were still included the, the highest mortality. I mean, people were still dying uh, statistically after they went off of that, that that insurance program, and so and the mental health complications complications were an issue as well. So. Things can happen. I mean, we can we can get things accomplished. In 2024, there was no actual effort to be made to expand Medicaid. It's the first time that I can remember. Because going into the game, uh, there was no, there was absolutely no prayer for it. This year, I think it's going to be, there's going to be a hard press again. So one of our uh, online listeners is asking if a good angle would be to ask detractors to come up with a better solution for this goal of caring for each other if they don't think Medicaid expansion is it, facilitate dialogue. What Has are the other options? Well, there are, uh, and that's an excellent question, and that's the, that's really a really question that has to be asked. But the, the from a practical point of view, they have been looking for that for 10 years. Because from the very start, um, the answer to that question was Wyoming can do it better. We have a better plan. Okay. <laughs> After that, it got real quiet. Uh, and it's still pretty quiet. Uh, there are people out there, there that advocate uh, the very low. Uh, cost insurance programs that some of which are not actually insurance are not even actually insurance programs that covers so little if you're seriously ill you you will lose your the fields. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing uh, is high deductible, low cost, high deductible insurance programs. That's not actually a good option. It is well. The, 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 what I see as the flaw in that is what we're trying to do is get people to seek care early in their illness and or to prevent care. If you have a high deductible insurance and not a lot of cash in the bank, that is equivalent to no insurance. And, uh, and maybe worse, because then they look at you and say, well, you at least got insurance, so pay up and are uh, yeah. less likely to deal on health care costs. Mm -hmm. Now, that brings up the other solution to this, by the way, is you go to the provider and work a deal and get a cut rate for your health care. And the, the one that the fellow that, that last brought this up was an anesthesiologist from uh, there was testified to the state and said, well, this is what they should do. They should, we should be just having them wheel and deal, you know, and, and make a deal. And I, would, I just kind of thought, how do you deal? I mean, how do you deal with your anesthesiologist in a car accident? I mean, you like, you know, try to whittle them down at half price. Before. Why are you laying on the bed waiting for your surgery? <laughs> and, and, and does that mean that I'm only out half of the surgery? In other words, I'm, I'm awake. Yeah, the first yeah. half, yeah. Or yeah. the second yeah. half. Yeah. Just yeah. asking. Right. Well, that and, and the possibility. For a lot of this, you're not dealing one on one with the most of us don't even see the anesthetologist when we're in a surgery. No. If the, it's a hospital, we're not dealing with one person, we're dealing with an entity which can say, above all. And, and realistically, hospitals will do 
will make adjustments and that sort of thing. But again, uh, then that means they're not getting paid. Yeah. And if the hospital's not getting paid by uh, a particular patient, then everybody else is paid for. And which brings me to another little detail is Wyoming's healthcare insurance costs are some of the highest in the nation. Mm -hmm. Probably not the only reason because demographics makes a difference. But one of the reasons is because we did not expand Medicaid. Right? Uh, and uh, so we are covering the cost of people that either made bad decisions uh, or even made bad decisions of deciding not to be to get insurance uh, or bad decisions in their lifestyle without insurance. We're paying their uh, their bills as well as your bills. And um, can I ask how how much of an obstacle is some of the care? For instance, CHIP is the one that comes to mind immediately. Is that people have difficulty filling out the forms? providing whatever needs to be provided, et cetera. I'm thinking about some of the things I've been reading in Montana, sure. where people have been cut from Medicaid. And in a number of cases, I don't know what the percentage is, it's because they couldn't fill out the form, they couldn't return it on time. And mm -hmm. I'm thinking about USPS, you can't send anything in, you better figure on six weeks if it's gonna get from right. here to, but is that another piece? It's, it's potentially. So again, um, definitely not trying to, you know, um, promote or even hawk, you know, some of the things going on at One Health. But what I would like to say is those community health workers, those are those are opportunities that they'll work with you to help you complete those forms. They'll work with Enroll Wyoming. We're working, I mean, we have these people in play work. And then Core Knowledge will that'll help you um, gain and get all the documentation you need, and then trying to again reduce those barriers. And it's you know, it's us as community members coming together and saying, you know, what one stop shop, you know, what what resources can we put in place to support people who might have an issue filling out forms. Um, are there are there you know resources in place? And again, those those navigators is what I like to refer to them as um, are are a helpful piece of that. Okay. But of course, that is going to be a barrier. I know that um, having children in the school system that is something that when you get your now it's all electronic, but when you get your full packet. I mean, they do provide you with, you know, here's some information if you need to provide health insurance for your child and, you, and your child isn't covered. But again, there's a lot of paperwork involved. And so that can be, of course, a barrier. And if I don't have a computer or the internet, then boom, it really goes south. It really goes south. You're not wrong. And everything now, I mean, towards the last couple of years my children were in school, everything was done on electronically. I mean, there was... I mean, I remember the big packet would come home and oh, here we go. You fill out the same thing 10 times, but now everything is electronic. So how are people who might not have those um, the internet resources or a computer, how are they doing that? Are they able to get to the library? You know, are someone supporting them? Who knows? It's kind of scary out there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Amanda. Yeah, I was just gonna say, I know, um, a couple of years ago, I worked for the state for WIC, and we referred people a lot to DFS. Yeah. Because DFS will sit down at their computer in the DFS office, one on one, you know, and filling out um, the forms. My frustration um, prior to becoming a pastor, I practiced for the GYN. And my frustration, and I say this all the time the only way you can get Medicaid, get on Medicaid in Wyoming, is if you're a female and you're pregnant. That's pretty much it. And and it was so frustrating. So I, I just don't understand why people can't understand why it's important to expand that thing. I, I don't under, like, are they not thinking? I mean, <laughs> it just makes so much sense to me. Agreed. And I, I just, I'm frustrated. I've always been frustrated. It, it, it gets back to uh, some of the just 
And what's their number one issue? What is their big roadblock? Is it money? I think it's fear of federal uh, the federal <laughs> government. Oh, and as far as Wyoming is all different. Oh, yeah. And, and maybe Idaho and, and similar places. I feel like it's a fear of federal government that they will either overreach their Get their, hand their authority right. and, and, and take over my stuff. Yeah. Uh, or that they'll pull the funding is what I heard. <laughs> and that's that is exactly right. And that they'll get us hooked on it and then pull it. Right. Now the uh, there's a couple of corollaries of that. One is, well, uh, what happens if they do pull it? I mean, if we get go down the Medicaid expansion route and so then two years later the feds pull it and we can't afford to do it. Then we drop it. Actually, that that is part of the law. The states can withdraw from Medicaid expansion. Not a single state in the union has withdrawn from Medicaid expansion once they've done. How many states have have, have gone that route? Um, there is thirty. I think there's twelve states that have that that have not that have not. And so of the. Whatever that math is, uh, yeah, the majority have, have, that they have accepted it have implemented it for what now I have almost 10 years, mm -hmm. and they're still keeping it. And right. their medical systems are I'm not the last have, have not, have not, have not <laughs> their medical systems uh, are do we have statistics to show things like they have a healthier yes. community? Yeah, so there actually, are those statistics. Yeah, there's actually been studies that show that the expansion of Medicaid to improve the general health of the community. Like Where would I find those in the states that are most allowed? Uh, yeah. Actually, in Wyoming, actually. Yeah. 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 Okay. Is that data? Okay. okay. Yeah, I think we're very up to state, very up to date. Mm -hmm. We do a good job. If you're interested in that, mm -hmm. well, and, and the problem with you, know, you were asking what's the cause of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've got the numbers, we've got data, we've got real life stories yeah. that we've all either seen or experienced ourselves. But how do you combat the fear? Yeah, the, that's not the, logic based. Yeah, yeah, the, the opposition is largely not knowledge based. It is um, that's just not the way we do that in Wyoming. We don't let the federal government we don't let the federal government in. They'll and, just screw it up. But, but <laughs> you know that the, the answer to that is is pretty simple. I mean we let the federal government say payment in lieu, payment in lieu of taxes dollars, millions. They pay highway dollars, they pay Medicare, they pay VA it, those are all federal dollars. So it's in my mind. They pay our, our, our law enforcement <laughs> to some extent. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of disingenuous to say we won't take federal dollars and yeah. take, it takes it, federal take federal, federal dollars. Federal. Uh, leave the potholes in the street. <laughs> So, you know, they pull, and they could pull highway funding. I'm old enough to remember when they did the 55 mile an hour speed limit. Anybody remember that? <laughs> well, we didn't have a lot of potholes because we were going to drive 70 miles an hour. Added or 21 alcohol. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> my son got caught. Yeah. <laughs> he was not grandfathered in. <laughs> Yeah, we have and we have Cade, but that's not the way to do business. Caving is not the way to do business. I understand that. And so <laughs> so I have there's a there was an online comment that I wanted to get back to, maybe Roy, you could address it. It said, um, Governor Meade had meetings of chaplains, law enforcement, regular folk. What happened to our statewide coming together? Um, Meade did it, and how can we now? It kind of fell by the wayside for a few years. Okay. Governor Gordon has been pushing hard, at least around the mental health conversation. Right. 
So we did a series of town hall meetings. Mm -hmm. uh, we signed on with the yeah. Veteran Suicide Challenge almost two years ago, mm -hmm. which the SMR is part of that. Mm -hmm. uh, so Governor Gordon is working in that direction. Okay. Part of the challenge we see at the state level is in the prevention offices, we have constant turnover. Mm -hmm. They're yeah, what? Constant what? turnover. Mm -hmm. they, they bring in freshly graduated people and put them in the positions and then pay them for the work that they do. They develop some experience and they go someplace else. So we have a constant turnover, would that be fair to say? You mean at the Department of Health? At the Department of Health. Sure. Which is a lot of, where a lot of the prevention efforts come sure. from, is that Department of Health. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll weigh in on that some later. No. That's the Department of Health, but as far as the statewide coming together. And I would say that under this current funding model, um, I have been, um, um, it's been working for us because we have, we're able to take these dollars and use them at the most local level. So for, for me personally, in my experience, um, I think it's working very well because the way we operate here in Park County is very different than they'll operate in, in Albany County, Campbell County, you know, anywhere else. So we are able to use um, kind of that local, have that local conversation around local conditions and so I, um, I think we're doing better, um, but I think, you know, challenges are always, sometimes we see that work being very siloed um, at the state level. Um, I do think we're very much trying, um, there's a you know, community prevention unit, a behavioral health unit. There's all these different units that are you know, meeting goals and, you know, creating, creating work. And sometimes they might not, um, you know, communicate with each other. So they're duplicating efforts or like, are leaving gaps in the system. Nothing frustrates me more. I mean, mm -hmm. honestly, it's like, how can we just come alongside each other, support each other and be stronger together, right? Instead of, you know, doing the same thing over and over and then we're not seeing any positive results around it. So we're I will say as, as we visit with other states, we're very fortunate and we do have, as Wendy said, a, a community prevention person in every county, mm -hmm. about 23 counties. And that is unique. unique. And that state budget goes to the Department of Health. So we do have a lot of efforts taking place. It's just mm -hmm. that. So is that like a one person, one a faith community could reach out to? Is that community prevention person? And then that would reach out to everyone. I would encourage you to find out who your community prevention person is in your county and find out when their coalition meetings are. And, and attend one or two and, and find out what you can do to help and how you can get involved. We, um, speaking from, from us, we would love to have you. We have some, some little subgroups that if you're really interested in mental health, we have um, a group that meets every month um, by Zoom um, to our, around mental health and suicide prevention. And we're talking about all the things that are important to us here in Park County. So I think that that would be my first um, call to action for your finding out who that is and seeing what work is already going on and how you can, you know, maybe you can host a training. Maybe you can host um, a community conversation. We're always looking for ways, I'm speaking for myself, ways to you know connect with more um, community members, with families, you know, how can we, you know, all support each other? And so that's the win-win for, for us. The, back to the, we've all got a seat at the table. We have to turn the cycles down. The barriers that are still there. And there's always been this, the faith community is there at arm's length. Mm -hmm. Because you get into doctrinal issues, you get into all the other conversation that comes into place. But in the reality situation, those of you that are pastors, how much training do you actually get on suicide? I got a lot more on the end times <laughs> and psychology <laughs> and seriotology than I did on how to keep somebody alive. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so I got a bunch, but only because I did my chaplaincy rotation through the VA. Like they were awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hear lots of concern about, well, that's a psychiatric yeah. approach. 
Well, you know what? <laughs> we can debate that back and forth. Right. Yeah, I'm like, but I don't care what any learning is good learning. <laughs> what, what the answer to that, Dave, for those of us who are active in our churches would be? Did you study the story of the Good Samaritan? <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm looking at. I don't care what your theology is. You've got to be alive to figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. The alive comes first. We can figure out anything else after the fact. Yeah. Yeah. We're coming up to the end of two hours. And I want to say thank you. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Uh, this has been a great conversation. Wow. Um, and your efforts are certainly appreciated. And um, hopefully we can take what you taught us <laughs> and we can take it back to Saratoga and Sundance and Cheyenne and other places. <laughs> well, you're already here, pal. Yeah. <laughs> but, but there are things that I didn't necessarily then, know. Yeah, you, you can tell know. by my question. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I will, you'll tell more people and then yeah. we'll continue to do that. Well, I, mean, I was kind of about the, uh, the efforts that you have in the local schools for providing the, the, the help for the kids. Mm -hmm. um, and and see if there's something in our own county already down at Carbon County, or can we bring it down there? Mm -hmm. well, I know the through I, I know who your people are in Carbon, okay. so I can help I'm connect you. you there. Thank you. We need to do that. We'll do that. Mm -hmm. We've got good things happening. So, Roy. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. You. For your service <laughs> in the past, now, and in the future. <laughs> Dr. Gray, can I say that? No, no. Gray, is that good? Thank you, too. Um, you got your chicken. Oh, my goodness. Oh. <laughs> okay. I, got, I got to see you with stories on that. You don't have and we will be posting this online, so hopefully more people will watch it and yeah, and we'll spread the message. So thank you for helping uncomplicate the Medicaid issue mm -hmm. as much as possible. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Wendy. Thank you for everything you do. And uh, from the rest of my group, uh, we get about an hour's break before we get the, yeah. the law enforcement panel. And we'll thanks say, online. We'll yeah. say goodbye. Thank you all. To our online people. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for joining us from wherever you are. And, and your comments online as well. Adios. <laughs>